so we were going to discuss the next part of pranayam now in this class and then i have the question answer session for both programs so uh, the other yesterday we did a simple pranayam which is called anulom vilom alternate breathing and i told you what the uh, effects and benefits of doing this pranayam physical as well as mind and as well as spiritual and then i taught you what is what we call in kriya the hum sa technique which again is a very useful pranayam and I, we already explained the background of pranayam why pranayam is done and so on so we don't have to go into it again now the the other important kriya i'm not kriya pra, kriya simply means a technique uh, pr, is called the one is called the uh, kapal bhati and the other is called the bhastrika now from the name kapal bhati you know what it means it cleans up the kapala which means people who have constant sinusitis who get up in the morning and do <laughs> can't open my nose uh, slight headaches which usually are mistaken for migraine uh, and so on their inner uh, passages the sin sinus passages are blocked so yoga takes care of the body the mind and then the spiritual so first the body when you do uh, uh, the kapalabhati what happens is that the air is forcibly thrown into the sinus areas and because of that the sinus begins to get clear and when the sinus is clear and when you have no headaches when i say headaches i am saying in the not in the literal sense when you have no headaches meaning when you are not always thinking about my close nose my headache my this my that and not sniffing all the time as if i am perpetually crying then what happens the mind also calms down when the mind calms down what does patanjali say chitta vritti nirodha when all the vrittis which means all the all the conflicting thoughts and all the distractions are removed the mind becomes calm and this calm mind is a take off point to go to anything higher so this happens now how is kapala bhati done you will see that bhastrika and kapala bhati are very close to each other similar but they are not the same in kapala bhati you forcefully throw the breath out but your breathing inhalation is involuntary you don't have to inhale you have to exhale rather than the inhalation becomes involuntary so how is this let me show you take a deep breath and throw it out <laughs> then <laughs> you see i am not deliberately breathing in i'm only throwing out this is kapalabhati sometimes when you continuously do it for about 1 uh, minute or 2 minutes you may feel a little dizzy nothing to worry that's because the oxygen content is being lowered for the time being it will catch up when you finish feel like taking a deep breath then you're back to normal this is kapalabhati how do we do it you can sit on a chair and do it or you can sit on a um, cross leg and do it it's up to you i suggest that cross leg is the best posture for any yogic practice right so this is kapalabhati now there is another one called bhastrika what happens in bhastrika since we are using both the nostrils since none of the nostrils are blocked with the finger like anulom vilom since it is one both are open and the breath comes in and out in a very uh, fast movement and also deep so 
you saw kapalavati mostly throwing the air out in vastrikaids both in and out you are voluntarily taking in the air and you are voluntarily taking it out so it is see the difference can you see the difference is not it is both bellows vastrika means bellows so it is in and out in and out in and out so when you do this in and out for about half a minute continuously then hold the breaths for a while don't let it go and then <sighs> breathe out this is bastrika now if you ask me what are the benefits first the lungs are well irrigated with oxygen it's a what you call a hyperventilation of the uh, uh, bronchioles in your lungs anybody who does vastrika i assure you both kapalabhati and vastrika regularly is l- infection which are connected to the lungs there's a very little chance of affecting the person so those who have been doing vastrika and kapalabhati regularly i'm sure even the last pandemic even if they might have had an infection it wouldn't have affected the lungs as it has to those who have not practiced so watch again vastrika now when you do vastrika if you keep your eyes closed and enjoy the process then you are not only doing an exercise to irrigate your lungs you are also do a meditating exercise in which your breath and your mind moves in the shushumna nadi which is the central nadi we discussed that the spine so while you know the breath is moving into the lungs the air is moving into the lungs i understand that it doesn't go to the spine clear but since the mind is going up and down breathing in and out it affects the spine and therefore both work together the breath as well as the movement of the mind the idea in yoga is once the breath and the mind are coupled together after some time the mind can do functions and the breath has very little to do i mean this is a novel uh, idea which we need to which means then man lives by mind rather than by breath let's not hurry on this this is something uh, which takes a long time for the yogi to achieve so anyway so this breathing in and out vastrika on the one hand it improves your breathing technique it improves your breathing capacity it irrigates all the bronchioles in your lungs inside your lungs apart from that it creates a meditative state when does the meditative state happen when you do vastrika in and out for some time and then take a deep breath and stop and close your eyes you will feel like pin pricks you will feel and very pleasant feeling and then exhale now at this point while you hold your breath and while you exhale your breath you see that there's hardly a moment of thought hardly there may be some stray thought here and there but generally not why because we are fully involved in something internal and therefore the mind has does is not allowed to think of something external therefore it learns by practice to go within and meditate so any meditation practice if it is preceded by vastrika and kapalabhati is sure to become better than otherwise now this is uh these are two more pranayams that i have discussed today now there is a third pranayam which the yogis say generally helps to activate the energies which are normally not active in human beings in most human beings the creative energies 
energies also it is useful for those who find it difficult to um, who have problems with sexual activities and in in the case of yogis who want to sublimate it it brings about a sublimation of the energies into higher level energies and we call it the bhairav pranayam uh, in which the left nostril is closed like you do in anulom below and you start breathing only through the right nostril it also heats up the system what mind now mind you it's better to do it in winter than in summer because you do it for some time you feel you're sweating even when you do bhastrika and kapalabhati you'll sweat huh so it's always uh, pranayam is better practice during the cold season than the hot season uh, so in this pranayam you shut the left nostril and you start breathing through the right nostril so how do you breathe through the right nostril simple normally we take a long breath in this you don't take a long breath you take short breaths like this hold take as many short inhalations as possible generally you can do up to 10 8 9 10 short by the time it will be full then hold your breath close your eyes and sit quietly hold it as long as you are comfortable then exhale through the left one long exhalation no jerks while you are breathing in there are like you will feel the jerky motions actually you are doing it in small quantities for like full okay now if you do this one is the entire body is energized and that particular energies that flow through the shushumna are stabilized and brought to an area so these are the three pranayams four including yesterday's five which i have discussed more than this in a class like this we cannot discuss this is more than enough actually even if you take one of them and start working on especially the anulom milom it will keep you healthy alternate nostril breathing it will keep you healthy and when you are ready you will also be able to go deeply into meditation most important to remember when you do pranayam is that your mind is traveling along with the breath which means you are not doing it like you know normally we do something physically but the mind is not there it's not like that every inhalation your mind is following the inhalation every exhalation the mind is following the exhalation the most important thing to note in pranayama is not just breathing complete attention to your breath that is the key if even without doing any of these things you can have complete attention on your breath then you you can move into the higher levels of yoga <clears throat> you don't have to so now we have done kind of looked into yama niyama asana although i didn't demonstrate asanas which are easily available nowadays one thing you should remember with asanas is that there should be no jerky motions do everything cool quiet comfortable make sure that there are no jerky motions and uh after you have done your asanas always rest which is called shavasan shava means dead body so after you have finished your asanas always lie down like a dead body posture and rest for at least 5 to 6 minutes even if you fall asleep it is okay it doesn't matter unless you are going to office so important shavasan after asanas okay now we did so yama niyama asana 
pranayam. We have come to pranayam. Of the eight angas of yoga, we have kind of roughly looked into four. Now we have pratyahara, dharana, dhyana. Three more. Samadhi is also added as an anga, but it is not. It is a culmination. <clears throat> so, seven angas. In fact, one should say sapta anga yoga. Jadavashtanga yoga. But then it is different parts. So, uh, Now, pratyahara. Pratyahara is an attention, it is a, it's a, I know what should I use the word. Pratyahara is the, uh, not even a technique, mm, the, is the mindset, the state of mind, pratyahara where the yogi can shift, give complete attention to one thing and at will shift it to anything else if he wants. When you give attention to one thing only, all the time, then there is a word in psychology for this, obsession. A yogi is not obsessed with anything, including his meditation, believe me. Ah, so, we are trying to give attention but not be obsessed. So, pr this pratyahara has been loosely translated in many places as sense withdrawal. I beg to differ from this. A pratyahara means pratya, pratya special inputs. That's what it means. Ahara. Special inputs. Which means... The yogi develops the capacity to fix his attention on something and refix it at any given moment. So therefore what happens? A yogi when he is driving is not meditating, he is driving. Give complete attention to the driving is meditation. You see, people always complain, I sit down to meditate in the evening, my mind is wandering naturally because all the whole day the mind is wandering and suddenly how can you expect the mind for half an hour to remain without wandering? How? Not possible. So, you have to learn the art of the, the technique of Pratyahara. In Pratyahara, the yogi is driving, he is driving. When he is meditating, he is not thinking of his car. Hmm? Uh, he is thinking of his meditation. When he opened the bonnet of the car and is working on it, he is not thinking of pranayama or meditation, he is thinking of the car. This is meditation. Uh, otherwise what happens? Small distraction is enough to take you out of meditation. Because the, the technique called pratyahara has not been practiced. Simple rule, whatever you are doing, give complete attention to it. Then, shift to something, give complete attention to it. Don't split your attention here and there. This is essential to go into the deeper levels of consciousness, which starts with dharana and dhyana. Now, uh, otherwise you know what will happen. A person who could not sleep, couldn't get sleep, decided to go to a psychiatrist. So he put him on a couch hmm? and put the curtains and put dim light, blue light and then soft music playing yeah, and so on. And then he said, now close your eyes. He was doing some sort of hypnosis to make him learn how to sleep. Close your eyes and think that, think of each part of your body. This is what you do in Shavasana also. Think of each part of your body from the toes up to the ankles, then the shin, then the thighs and so on to the top. And think that all the functions of your body are being performed by small little red men. Visualize. 
little red men take your mind off from all your worries imagine that you are in gulliver's travels and those little whatever those fellows are those red colored guys are work red or blue or whatever they are working now in the leg part you tell those fellows who are working little fellows who are working in my leg please go home chutti ho gayi ghar jao and then visualize they are going away they put down their tools and they walked out then go to the next and go on like that so this guy was doing it but he didn't know pratyahara because anyway he was doing it it came up to the middle of his body and at that point the door opened and his wife came in wearing anklets tinkling anklets ching 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 she came in this guy suddenly said all oh, little red men please come back <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> there is no pratyahara there <laughs> So, Pratyahara. Now I am going to tell you another story, which illustrates how the secret of yoga is giving attention to what one is doing at that given point. Not only in when you are meditating. Karma yoga, according to the Gita, is giving complete attention to the work that you are doing. especially if it is work not for the self but for, for, for others leave that for the time being and if you are meditating complete attention to meditation if you are working complete attention to karma yoga if you are not meditating and reading vedanta let's say deeper levels of vedanta you are doing the brahma sutras now don't sit and meditate give complete attention to what is being said and you will find that you end up in meditation through that way also so this so i'm going to tell you a story you might hear see that story in some of my youtube videos um uh, have you you must have heard of zen right zen very attractive imported stuff coming from japan made in japan zen huh? everybody must have heard you get people get excited when they see imported things you know mm. anyway now zen i'm not saying anything wrong with zen it's fine i'm just looking at the other side now in zen do you know that the founder of zen was a south indian monk buddhist monk from somewhere near tamil nadu thanjavur who later on became bodhi dharma by name bodhi dharma was the first person to take this particular brand of buddhism from india outside he also should be credited with taking the art of self defense unarmed combat from india to china and then to japan it went what later on became kung fu jiu jitsu and whatever uh, so all derived from a particular south indian martial art called kalari so bodhi dharma <coughs> when he traveled to china he was already an expert in unarmed combat because monks are not supposed to carry weapons anyway those dangerous times he traveled to china even now it is dangerous to travel to china but uh, so he went there and i have traveled in china he went there and he was staying high up on a hill and now how did the zen name come about uh bodhi dharma took a particular brand of yoga i'm sorry buddhism which laid great stress on meditation internal meditation pranayam and so on. and therefore he called it dhyana buddhism it came to be known as dhyan dhyan buddhism dhyan is meditation now you cannot say dhyan in chinese you can only say chan 
like uh, Vivekananda became becomes Vivekananda in Bengali. Dhyan becomes Chan in China. Mm -hmm. So this Dhyan became Chan, and when Chan went to Japan, it became Zen because their language is very guttural. This is the history of Zen. So it's it's from our own back garden. But you know the jasmine in the other fellow's back garden smells better than your own. Uh, in Malayalam, in India, in South Malayalam, we have a saying, "Muttatta mullekke mana mila." That means the jasmine in your garden doesn't have a good smell. The other house is nice. So in the same way. Anyway, so this is how Zen went. Now Bodhidharma was staying in China on the top of a hill. The hill. No internet, no advertisement, no arrow marks, no Google map. He was staying on the top of a hill. So to find him itself was difficult. Two young men went looking for him. They heard that Bodhidharma is staying there. He is a master of Zen. He is the best teacher to have. So let's go there. So two young men. They struggled for three days, four days, looking, asking. Finally, they climbed the hill and reached there, tired, dirty, clothes torn, hungry. Then it was uh, lunch time for Bodhidharma. What do monks do? They have lunch in a bowl. So he had his bowl, wooden bowl, and a spoon. He was drinking this some soup, simple soup, prepared vegetable, whatever. This is the time when these guys went up. They didn't wait to see what's happening, what he's doing. Nothing. They went straight and fell down. They didn't ask what he was doing. They just went, and they. Uh, Fell down and all, and got up and said, "Sir, uh, we have come a long way. We have been uh, with great difficulty. We have come to see you. Finally, we have found you." Just now, somebody told me that when I was walking in Malayalam, and please teach me Zen. Zen. Now. Bodhidharma was drinking his soup, so he turned and said, "I am drinking my soup," and continued. They waited for some time. He's going on slurping the soup. He got impatient again, and they were hungry also. <sighs> said once again, "Sir, please teach us Zen." Now the culmination in yoga is called samadhi. The culmination in Zen is called Satori. So please give us Satori, please. Give. Again he said, "I am drinking my soup." Third time they asked. He said again, "I am drinking my soup." So they got very upset. They, uh, then he called somebody and said, "Give them their soup." So they ended up sitting down on the floor with. Uh, Drinking the soup, then it occurred to them what a silly thing we are doing. We came for satori and we are sipping soup. So they again asked. Then he again said, "I am drinking my soup." So they said, "We are also drinking our soup." By the time he had finished, so he stopped, and he said, "No, you are not drinking your soup. You are drinking your soup." And you're thinking of Zen, Satori. While me, I'm drinking my soup. I'm drinking my soup. I'm drinking my soup. This is Zen. You get what pratyahara means. When you're doing one thing, you're not doing something else. Doesn't apply to driving, okay? Hands on the steering. Legs on the clutch. You have to do multiple things. 
I am talking about other things, meditation. Mm. In nowadays, of course, automatics are there, so it's almost the same, like Zen. So, <clears throat> um, this capacity which we need to develop through attention, there is no special technique for it. Where you do exactly what you are doing with complete attention. As you practice this, even in meditation, when you sit down, you will be only meditating and not doing or thinking of anything else. It takes time, it takes practice because we are accustomed to that kind of irregular thinking. So this is Pratyahara, withdrawal of any thought when required and fixing it on something else when required. Is there a technique for it? No, it comes only through practice also through the understanding that if you need to do whatever you are doing to the best of your capacity, then you need complete attention. It could be spiritual, it could be material, doesn't matter. This is Pratyahara. Now, Dharana is the next step. Dharana comes automatically from uh, Pratyahara. If you are able to hold your complete attention on one thing or one sound or one form or one symbol, anyone, for a length of time without distraction, it becomes dharana. Now, dharana can be external, dharana can also be internal. I don't think I have taught anybody even in satsang such an elaborate yoga class, really. Usually, we come and do some asanas and get going there, finished. Hmm? So, maybe these videos will be useful later on for people. Mm -hmm. So, uh, dharana can be internal as well as external. What is external dharana? I fix my attention on, let's say, an image. Suppose from my background and from my religious background or from my uh, childhood, I have been accustomed to think of the divine in some form. Let's say like Krishna or Shiva or, or a Linga or um, something like that. Suppose. Then I have an image of Krishna, let's say. And I look at that image with open eyes first. And then I visualize it internally. And I keep my complete attention on it without wavering, without allowing other thoughts to come in, with the mind steady. And Krishna says in the Gita while talking about Dhyana Yoga, about Yoga of Meditation, your mind should be like a flame when there is no wind, steady. Giving complete, this is called Dharana on form, on a particular form, deity. Other Dhyana, other dharana is fixing your attention on a image like a flame light a lamp look at the flame this is one or internally fixing your attention on any of the centers which are called chakras especially in the middle of the forehead or in the heart center internal you can combine both by having a light or a flame inside Visualizing. Or if you love your image of your deity, have that deity instead in your heart. Dharana. Now, what is dharana on sound? Make the sound of Om, for instance, and give complete attention to it. Om. Fixing your attention on Om. Or, close your ears and listen to the internal sounds that you hear. Will you hear a humming noise? Sometimes you hear a voice sound like a cicadas. Chik, 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 chik. Keep listening to that. 
complete attention. That is also dharana, which will culminate in dhyana, of course. So, these are some of the ways. Then, sound, light. Visualize the light or actually keep a light and fix your complete attention on it. Sound, I told you. Or if you don't want to chant Om, have a, a, a whatever a recording of someone chanting Om or any other mantra. Put on your headphones and listen to it. Give complete attention to it. This is the best thing to do. And nowadays with technology, you don't have to keep chanting. You get someone to chant, tape it and put it in your headphones and listen. Complete. This is called dharana on sound, dharana on image, dharana on a geometrical shape. In, in Tantra, there are many images like Sri Yantra, Yantras they are called, square, triangles, different kinds of... These are graphically prepared and their function is to fix your attention there. So, these are the forms of dharana, external and internal chakra dharana, which means giving complete attention, fixing your attention to the heart or this or the top of the head or any one of the plexuses which you have in your body. This is internal dhyana on the chakras, chakra dharana. Now, there is another form of dharana. Sitting, suppose you are on the seashore. There is nothing there. The waves are making a sound. Beautiful breeze blowing. Sit there with your open eyes. This open eyed dharana. And watch the waves and listen to the sound of the waves. This is also dharana. Or you are sitting under a huge tree in the forest. You know, if there is no human being or animal there, there is still some sound coming. The insects, the crickets make sounds in the trees. Sit and watch and listen to the sound under the tree. When you go up a mountain, I have been to the Himalayas, I have meditated in the Himalayas, you don't hear a sound, you hear nothing, just bare white eyes everywhere. Just watch. This is also open-eyed dharana. Now, when the dharana continues for a length of time without any break or disturbance, then it's called dhyana. Dhyana cannot be induced. Dharana can be induced. Dhyana, the moment I step in and try to induce something, it ceases to be dhyana. So, normally when you say meditate, it means dhyana. So, if somebody says, I am going to meditate, it cannot be meditation. Meditation is a naturally induced state that comes from dharana. So, why meditation, if you mean dharana, you are right. But by meditation, you mean dhyana, you are wrong. Because dhyana is a state. It is not something that you are doing. The moment I come into the picture, dhyana is gone. Out through the other door. I hope you understand what I am trying to say. Okay, let me put it this way. I am fixing my attention on the flame. Dharana. Or on a light, let's say. Or on a sound. Now what happens when the attention continues there without any disturbance? I am no more in the picture, it's going on. The moment I again get up and say, oh, I am listening to the sound, it's broken. I am not there, there is only that. There is only tat. There is no thumb there. This is dhyana. And then from there, we will discuss dhyana and samadhi tomorrow in full detail some examples of people who have gone through it and lived through it. The time being today we will stop at dharana and yesterday's and today's questions can be worked out.
नमस्ते गुरु जी नमस्ते ओके सो सो आई हैव अ क्वेश्चन लाइक इट्स अ कंटिन्यूएशन फ्रॉम द लास्ट सेशन एंड दिस सेशन आल्सो दैट इन योगा व्हेन आवर कॉन्शियसनेस इज अपलिफ्टेड टू अ हायर प्लेन लेट्स से फ्रॉम नॉन ड्यूअलिटी सॉरी ड्यूअलिटी टू नॉन ड्यूअलिटी यू आर वन विद द सुपर कॉन्शियस नेट देन व्हाट अ मिनट वेट वन मिनट आई नीड टू करेक्ट यू when there is non duality you are one with the super conscious does not exist you are not there yes okay now continue so how do you return back for example you enter the state of dhyana like you said 2 minutes ago and then you break it breaks so if if there is no external event let's say you are sitting in a jungle or something then how do you come return back to duality ha ah, good qu- good question now there are two things here there are people who go and sit there because they don't want to return back to this so called reality what you use the word reality for them that is the reality not this point number 1 point number 2 is that unless you have been such a deep meditator you cannot stay even if you want to it will be broken somehow why because we still have our moorings in this earth right somewhere the seeds which is called bijas of these attachments and desires are there in us even if they are not uh, exhibited or they are not externally manifested they are there so as long as these bijas are there there is no way you can actually stay for a long time in that you will automatically so that fear need not be there now those who stay they are people who have destroyed all the bijas there are no bijas left but they are doing that deliberately then there is no thought of should we come back if we have to how the thought itself is not there okay so so essentially your karma pulls you back in some sense or exactly. the karma the bija bija means the seeds of desire in us are still there in existence so we'll naturally have to come back even if that desire is selfless like a great person yogi might go into deep meditation sitting in the cave or in the forest somewhere and he's enjoying and then he says i need to share the knowledge that i have with others that is also enough to pull you back basically what i'm saying is there is no need of any fear that one one won't come out there are various reasons unless one says i don't want to okay sir uh sir another question on the physical part of pranayama that we did today uh so whenever i tried to do that with watching youtube videos or whatever yeah, do what? a, whenever i tried to do bhastrika pranayam or kapalbhati pranayam i feel a pain in the back like it's probably because of it is already stiff and all right is it on the left or right side or in the middle doesn't matter sir it's probably because i can't uh, i do all my working while sitting maybe i think you should do some spinal exercises to relieve your spine from tension and one of the exercise i would suggest is not to do with yoga it's to do more with kalari and ayurvedic massage but for that you don't have to lie down and get somebody to come and do it one technique is to get a tennis ball okay and uh, lean against a wall or have a hard bed on the table lie down put the tennis ball there so that you touch your back touches that and keep moving it if you are standing you can roll it especially in the area which becomes stiff little bit of pressure not too much is applied and the ball rolls here and there and then you take it off do it only for a minute or two if you do this every day probably you will be able to get back the uh the get out of that stiffness it may be because of your posture mostly sitting down quite possible uh see one of the ways in yoga we call it bandha bandha means closing tying you know bandhan 
बंधन राखी बंधन बंधन सो द बंधन मीन्स टू टाई अप नाउ वेन यू इफ यू हैव अ टैप विच इज लीक विच इज ब्लॉक्ड वन ऑफ द वेज ऑफ ओपनिंग द ब्लॉक इज टू शट इट कंप्लीटली विथ योर हैंड ओपन इट फुल्ली फुल प्रेशर ऑफ द वाटर कप दैन टेक इट ऑफ बंधन इज द पार्ट वेर यू शट इट वेन यू टेक योर हैंड्स ऑफ द वाटर फ्लो बिकम्स क्लियर इन द सेम वे द स्पाइन इज कनेक्टेड नॉट ओनली टू स्टिफनेस ऑफ द बैक बट टू वेरियस अदर ऑर्गन्स बिकॉज मेनी नर्व्स फ्लो फ्रॉम दैट सो वेन एवर देर इज अ स्टिफनेस इन द स्पाइन एट सम पॉइंट देर इज अ ब्लड फ्लो इज नॉट ओके देर ऑल्सो सो वेन यू ब्लॉक इट विथ समथिंग नॉट वेरी हार्ड लाइक अ टेन इज बॉल सॉफ्ट नॉट सो सॉफ्ट नॉट then for some time it builds up there and when it is removed the flow starts again it is the principle of the bandha actually okay sir thank you thank you so uh, sir i wanted to know that the three angles that you talked of today pratyahar dhyan dharana and dhyan are they a sequential process like uh, for example if i may put it in my own words that pratyahar is a condition a condition that negates the possibility of distractions followed by dharana uh, which Got means uh, maintaining your attention and finally slipping into dhyana naturally yes. so if i simply sit in a cross leg position i focus on an object visualize it in a after closing my eyes and continue so where is pratyahara dharana and dhyana here the reason i'm asking this is sir because if i try to imbibe this practice in my daily life how do i evaluate that i have been able to practice pratyahara successfully or i have uh, been able to transition into dharana and dhyana successfully so if you could simply demarcate mm-hmm. the three processes yeah no it it need not necessarily be sequential because some people immediately once they sit down and meditate they are already into dharana and dhyana i am saying for those who need to deliberately practice it step by step as in the yogic teachings pratyahara is as essential in daily life so that when you sit down to do dharana you are not distracted because the mind then develops the habit of fixing his attention on one thing only without being distracted You see that so pratyahara helps in that, but actually pratyahara is not a separate section. It has been divided into three sections: pratyahara, dharana, and dhyana, only to distinguish the technique, not as uh, as an actual thing. You understand? So the sequence is made only for the person to start here and end there. It's not as if they are separated from each other. with any stiff uh, um partitions that the same so suppose i sit immediately my mind has no distractions it goes into deep meditation now i am i have sir i have surpassed um atyahara and dharana i am totally into dhyana but that dhyana always will not come not always sometimes it's possible if you need it to happen full proof always then is better to regularly practice pratyahara so that the dharana immediately is turned into dhyana see i also said something remember that dhyana is not something that you deliberately produce dhyana is a culmination of dharana mm. हाँ बिकॉज इन ध्यान आई यू आर हार्डली देर देर इज ओनली द ध्यान आर गोइंग ऑन एंड वेन दैट डीप एंड इट इज ऑलरेडी समाधि वी विल डिस्कस दैट टुमारो सो आई कैप दैट पार्ट फॉर टुमारो सो सर इफ आई लाइक आई हैव अ हैबिट ऑफ प्रैक्टिसिंग सम ऑफ दिस योगी प्रैक्टिस डेली सो इट सो हैपन्स दैट समटाइम्स आई एम एबल टू आई एंड अप in a good state but sometimes i'm not able to so that is a, uh, so therefore to end up in a good state try to look into the meaning of pratyahara in daily life 
if you look into that then you will see that that thing is better yes sir thank you welcome sir uh, there are no further questions one uh, person has asked to suggest uh, when is a good time to do pranayam so the best time to do pranayam is when the air is clear which is in the morning uh, when there is still not the fumes of the cars and vehicles coming in so earlier the better but because you get up too early be careful that when you are driving to office you don't fall asleep keeping that aside the best time for pranayam would be 4 o'clock in the morning or 4:30 in the morning beautiful time in fact if you learn to get up early there's much you can do in the morning which there is no time to do in the day so earlier the better up to 8 o'clock up to 7 o'clock dawn ushas ushas is that sandhya where the the uh, day is meeting Uh, the night the dawn that is the best time to practice pranayam however if you cannot practice it at that time you can also practice it in the evening when all work is over everything is died down nowadays work the entertainment starts only in the evening that is the problem well, let's forget about that so <laughs> evening is also a good time to do your pranayam you can actually do pranayam at any time if you miss in the morning and if you cannot do in the evening you can also do at midday but never do pranayam with your abdomen full of food one golden rule for pranayam at least two and a half hours after you had a full meal you can do pranayam but my suggestion would be early morning is the best time for pranayam especially if you have a garden or something sit there and do your pranayam don't be ashamed of doing pranayam what will my neighbor say uh, do your pranayam probably your neighbor will also start doing pranayam <laughs> okay right thank you very much namaskar